Welcome and thank you for joining us for this North Metro TV Local Decision 2012 candidate debate. Tonight I'm joined by the candidates running for the Minnesota House of Representatives in District 41A, Connie Bernardi and Dale Helm. Thank you both for being here tonight and it is uh, nice to see you in the studios. Thanks for, be for being here tonight. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks, Ben. We're going to start tonight with opening statements and then we'll go into a question and answer segment and then we'll conclude with closing statements after all the questions. We'll start now with opening statements. Connie Bernardi, you're first with your one minute opening statement. Thank you. I'm Connie Bernardi and I'm running for House District 41A, which includes New Brighton, Fridley, and Spring Lake Park. I'm a mom, a wife, a community advocate, and a lifelong member of our community. Our children are grown now and I decided to run for office because of the deep love I have for our community. And I'm really frustrated as I've been hearing when I've gone door to door throughout the community of how frustrated about how people don't get along at the Capitol and they're not working together and the extreme and divisive politics. People are fed up. You know, the ones being hurt at the end of the day are our seniors, our students, our working families, and our small businesses. It's time we put the middle class first again. We need to be working on a strong economy, good paying jobs, as well as successful schools. My career has been creating community partnerships and bringing people together to help our Minnesota be stronger. I invite you to join me so we can work together to create hope and opportunity for all Minnesotans. I ask for your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Dale Helm, your opportunity for your one minute opening statement. Well, thank you, Ben. And thank you, voters. I want to say thank you so much for the wonderful support. As I look across the district and I see my signs on Democratic lawns, Republican, independent lawns, as well as many businesses, who are all saying in one unified voice, we want Dale Helm for our representative and a new relationship in our open seat. Now tonight, during this debate, I want you to remember three words, and it's already begun. And that are the three words of community, divisiveness, and polarization. These are three buzzwords that my opponent, Connie Bernardi, does use, taken from my campaign messages from 2010 and 2012. These are used by Connie to portray herself in more of a moderate position. I would actually want you to know that her record is the exact opposite. As a minority whip in the DFL, she was not only responsible for making sure that everyone was there to vote, but making sure how everyone voted. If you look at her record, you will see she was a DFL rubber stamp for their agenda. So when you hear these words, it is buyer beware. Thank you both for your opening statements. We'll move on now to our question and answer segment. During the question and answer segment, the candidates were given the topics before they came into the studio, but not the exact questions. The questions are all placed inside of our question jar. There are 19 in total. We'll get through a number of them tonight, and we'll start by drawing out whatever our first question is here. Uh, Dale, you'll be first on the first question okay. here. What is one thing that you would like to change or enhance about Minnesota's K-12 education system? Well, for the K-12 education system, there's a number of things I'd like to see done. The first one is I want to make sure that we pay off our school shift. Uh, I'm sure my opponent, Connie Bernardi, would agree with me on that. Uh, I also would like to see a removal of using K-12 through uh, school shifts as a budgeting tactic. In the last 20 years, we've had, uh, sorry, 25 years, we've had 20 uh, school budget shifts. I would like to see education funding stabilized, and I would also like to see um, us continue the proud tradition we have had of supporting our K-12 through education. Um, these are the things that will help us in the future and I think it's important for the voters to know that during this current uh, legislature they did increase by 430 million uh, out of the, uh, well they wanted to repay 430 million to the budget shift. Something that I think we need to begin but something that we need to aggressively take care of. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Connie Bernardi, your opportunity now. What is one thing that you would like to change or enhance about Minnesota's K-12 education system? Well, I think the most important thing is we need to have a vision for Minnesota. And I believe that vision ought to be a world-class education system where we compete, we're competing with students from all over the world. And then the other thing is to start addressing some of the key issues that our schools are facing. Across Minnesota, it's declining enrollment. It's a lot of students living in poverty, and then there's a lot of students with special needs. There's a lot of challenges facing our schools, and we need to have innovation and f create opportunities so that students can excel and complete in this global economy. One of the challenges that our schools are facing are a huge achievement gap, 
and that's something that Minnesota needs to address and close so that we can have a very productive workforce and we can strengthen our economy and move Minnesota forward. Thank you for your answer. After every question, the candidates will have an opportunity for 15 seconds of rebuttal time, and Dale Helm, you have the first opportunity for that. Well, a lot of things that Connie just said I do agree with, and uh, I do agree that we're in a global economy. I do agree with we need to meet the new challenges ahead. But one of the things I also think is very important is we maintain local control and that we also uh, recognize that we're currently funding 65% uh, of our state uh, to education, which is the highest in the uh, central states. All right. Connie, your opportunity. No, thank you. All right. We'll move on now to our next question. Uh, this question, uh, Connie, will be starting first with you. As a state legislator, how would you work together with federal, county, and local levels of government to make the biggest difference for your district? That's a very good question because at the, at the legislative level, there's a lot of things that come down from the federal government that impact the state government, and there's a lot of things that we do at the state government that impacts local government. And one of the things that we really need to work together is to make sure that we're not dumping all the um, responsibility on the property taxes in our communities. Our property taxes have skyrocketed and now have become the top uh, revenue source for, for the state of Minnesota. And that is um, troubling to our seniors and to um, people that are having a hard time struggling. And working together to make sure that our services are funded properly and we're not just passing them down onto property tax owner. That's something that we need to be working on. We need a fair tax system. Thank you. Uh, same question now to you, Dale Helm. Uh, as a state legislator, how would you work together with federal, county, and local levels of government to make the biggest difference for your district? Well, I, I was uh, answering this earlier when we were starting the interview, but uh, the answer I would give is, uh, first off, it has to do with a different approach. Uh, to how we're doing things. Right now, the legislators, they work in a bubble at the Capitol, and you can't do that. You have to have an open door. And uh, I've already started the process by talking to the different city governments and the Noka County Commissioners, talking about how we can work together while at the Capitol on the issues that everyone wants to see. Town hall meetings before the Capitol session and after the session will help first put the voice of the people in and also have accountability after while we're working on these solutions. Now, referring to LGA specifically, I am a, a believer that LGA uh, is something we need to be responsible on, and I also think that the way that we can do that is city, gov uh, city governments working hand in hand with the state government so that the uh, citizens know exactly how much LGA they're receiving and they are getting a responsible share. Thank you. Opportunity for rebuttal time now. Connie, we first. Yes. Dale. Basically, I think the important thing when we speak about LGA specifically is that the state legislature can be the most generous possible. And if the city government itself is not responsible in return, uh, it could be considered a padding of the bill. So that's what I'm referring to. I'm just saying being responsible on both sides to make sure that we're taking care of our residents. All right. Move on to our next question now. Uh, Dale, you'll be first on this question. Uh, it's just simple. Uh, explain your position on the marriage amendment. Well, my, my position on the marriage amendment is uh, I think that voters need to look into their own hearts and uh, really think deeply about this and uh, vote their conviction. Uh, if you're asking you know, my position on it, I am a supporter of the marriage amendment. However, uh, I think it's very important that when we're talking about anyone who's going to serve in public office, that they are open to and respectful of all the voices that they would be serving in the district. That is the kind of representative I would be. So this one is one that is very, very personal. It is, uh, goes right to the root of many people's uh, personal value systems. So what I encourage everyone to do is come, vote, and vote your conscience. Uh, this discussion comes to every state at some point. And uh, many states have already made the decision uh, for the marriage amendment, uh, and it'll be Minnesota's time in November. Thank you. Uh, Connie, same question. Explain your position on the marriage amendment. I am not in support of the marriage amendment. I would be, I'll be voting against that. That's one of the things at the Capitol that I think people are really frustrated with is bringing up these divisive social issues when Minnesota is facing a huge recession and we need to be working on issues, our bread and butter issues of strengthening our economy and making Minnesota strong. 
So those are the kinds of things we ought to be focusing on the Capitol. And we already have a law on the books that um, prevents um, people that are in gay relationships from getting married. And enshrining it in our Constitution, I don't believe, is, is what Minnesota is about. So that's how I'm voting on the amendment. Right. Opportunity for rebuttal time, features. The important thing that most voters don't know is that by voting yes on the amendment, what it does is it makes it so that this discussion can continue, but you cannot have the discussion decided by judges or activist judges that are going to have a judgment and then set a precedent. It'll be the voters. All right. Opportunity for rebuttal time, Mr. Hughes. I'll pass. All right. Move on now to our next question. Uh, Connie, you'll be beginning on this question. In nearly every campaign, candidates speak of working across the aisle if they get elected. In what ways will you actively work with legislators from other political parties? Well, I have a track record of actually working bipartisan, bipartisanly <laughs> excuse me, across the aisle. I have, um, when Springbrook Nature Center's wetlands were being threatened and the stormwater runoff was uh, affecting the habitat and the wildlife and the plants that filter the water into the Mississippi River, I brought together Democrats and Republicans and we got critical funding needed to be able to restore Springbrook Nature Center. And the Nature Center, it was when they did the restoration project, it was the first wetland restoration project in the country. And actually one of those people uh, from the other party who uh, supported me on that, they were actually were in the parade with me at New Brighton. So that was pretty neat to have somebody from the other party who I had uh, worked with uh, walking in the parade with me. Thank you. Uh, Dale, in what ways will you actively work with legislators from other political parties? The way I will work with legislators is I will listen to them. The bottom line is, is that there are many good ideas that come from Democrats, Independents, or Republicans. All of this has to do with having an open, critical, and evaluating mind. To me, all the voices need to come to the table, all the voices should come to the table, and the best solution should win. I don't care which party creates that solution. For me, it's not about ego, it's about people. And I think that that's the direction that we need to go. And I think that, you know, this is the direction you want to see. So the way I would work with people across the aisle is I would be asking, what's your idea? How do you think we can address this? What do you think are the challenges ahead that you see as well as I see? And when we start having that attitude of Americans first, Minnesotans second, and always about our local communities, then we're ready to do something. All right. Opportunity for rebuttal time, if you choose. I'll pass. All right. And Dale, opportunity if you need it. The only thing I would say in rebuttal is, is that uh, I hear the same three issues all the time uh, with Connie Bernardi, and, and, and this one about the wetlands, it, it's a popular issue. When you look at her voting record and you look at the things in her record in the past, very much party line. So I don't see how she's worked across the aisle. All right, thank you. We'll move on to our next question. Uh, we've already touched on this somewhat, but it, this gets into a, another part of the issue, so I'm going to go ahead with this question as well. Um, Dale, you'll beginning, be beginning with this question. Okay. In a representative form of government, do you believe that a constitutional amendment is the appropriate place to form public policy? If so, what types of policies should be put to a constitutional vote? If not, what is the best way to determine public opinion on policy issues? Well, I don't think doing constitutional amendments as your uh, method is the way to do policy. The Constitution is supposed to be a strong framework upon which we work from, uh, the tenets, if you will. Uh, the best way, I think, that you work with your constituents is you listen to them. You give them opportunities to let them know what their concerns are, you are sincere about acting upon them and in doing that what you do is you provide an opportunity where as a community the voice is heard as an individual the voice is heard and then you as the representative need to do your level best in working with the other levels of government to help create those solutions to those challenges and needs so when it comes to public policy I always always am about the voter always having their voice being heard that you know, no matter what the opinion, no matter what area they come from, they need to be heard at all times. 
Thank you. Uh, Connie, same question. In a representative form of government, do you believe that a constitutional amendment is the appropriate place to form public policy? If so, what types of policy should be put to a constitutional vote? If not, what is the best way to determine public opinion on policy issues? I don't believe that constitutional amendments should be used to be passing policy. What it, what it happens is, is that at the Capitol, when policies are brought forward, constituents can weigh in on them, they can um, share their opinions about them, and people can have committees and come and voice their concerns. When it's put onto a constitutional amendment, there's not, a, there's not um, a lot of opportunity for people to provide their input and, and change those kinds of things. And once it's enshrined in the Constitution, it can't be changed unless it comes back and um, puts it up for a vote again. There might be things in a constitutional amendment that, for example, um, affect our veterans in a policy that gets passed in the amendment. But you can't go back and tweak that to make it work. And so that's, it's, not the, it's not a good place to be working on policy issues by using a constitutional amendment. So working with, the, working with the constituents, finding out what their concerns are, their ideas, and bringing those to the Capitol and helping making them happen, that's the best way to get policy passed. All right. Rebuttal time if you choose. Uh, the quick thing I would say is, is that she's right about the process of the Capitol. The problem is, is that that process is very fast, it's very uh, small, and it does not give an opportunity for a greater voice. That's why I think it's very important to have those venues so people can have that opportunity to voice their concerns directly. Rebuttal right. time if you choose. Okay. All right. Move on to our next question. Uh, Connie, you'll be first on this question. It's kind of long, so stick with me on this one. Nearly half of the country, 23 states to be exact, has right-to-work laws in place. Some are by state statute, some are by constitutional amendment, and some have both. This debate heated up during the last legislative session and is likely to occur again in the future. Explain your stance on right-to-work laws and what you believe would be the most appropriate way to enact them, constitutionally or through state statute if you believe in enacting them? Okay, first of all, I don't believe in enacting them. It's, uh, I think a better way to describe it is an anti-middle class, anti-worker piece of um, policy that people have tried, uh, you know, proposed to putting in the Constitution. And actually, um, that's been proposed at the state capitol this last year and um, barely was defeated at, at the capitol. So it did not get to become a constitutional amendment for voters to be able to vote on. The, um, we need to be uplifting workers in Minnesota. We have, uh, we have a state that has taken great pride in having um, workers being able to have a voice and being able to have the opportunity to have good paying jobs, being able to have weekends off, being able to have good hours, being able to have safe places to work. And um, part of that, a lot of that is been being able to have workers being able to have a voice. And taking that away and not allowing them to organize would not be helping our workers. And in fact, states that have it make around $5,000 less per worker than states that um, don't have that. All right. Dale, same question now to you. I'm just going to read the, the final part of it. Sure. Explain your stance on right-to-work laws and, and, if you, and what you believe would be the most appropriate way to enact them constitutionally or through state statute if you support enacting them. Well, first off, uh, I have thought about this long and hard. In the past, I have been a member of a union. Uh, there are good unions and there are bad unions and I do support right of work and the reason I do is because right of work actually gives incentive for uh, bad unions to be better and for good unions to remain good. If you have someone who is a non-union worker working next to someone who is a union worker and that union is doing a great job for them through benefits, through safety in the workplace and through health care, that worker is going to want to be a member of that union. What right to work does is it gives the employer a chance to look at other options and not have to deal with a monopoly. We've, we know that monopolies in corporate America are bad. Uh, we have laws against them. But for some reason, some people don't look at the monopoly of labor. The other issue is, is that it releases the worker that is, is there and gives them an option. Should I be a union member? Should I not? It doesn't stop them from joining the union. Thank you. Opportunity for rebuttal time, Connie? Pass. And Dale? One of the things that I noticed in Connie's literature was unnecessary, uh, unsafe, uh, things like that talking about right to work. Uh, the reality is, is the requirements for safety have to do with the employer, has nothing to do with right to work. Uh, the unnecessary part, again, refers back to the monopolies. So I would just say everyone needs to take a look at that a little deeper. 
Thank you. We're going to go ahead and uh, ask our final question from me <laughs> for the evening. And I am going to pass on this one because it is another one dealing with constitutional amendments, which we have already <laughs> discussed. All right. Dale, you are first on this question. Okay. With a projected deficit of over $1 billion in future state budget cycles, how will you specifically propose to fix Minnesota's ongoing budgetary problems? Well, first off, I'm kind of confused about the $1 billion deficit. I've heard about this before, but looking at the Minnesota Budget Office numbers, as well as the numbers that come out of the House, uh, remember, voters, the legislature came in with a $6.2 billion deficit, came out with a $1.2 billion surplus. And the projected for the next biennium is actually close to $34 billion. That's not a shortfall. So I, I actually question that number. Now, if there is a need for a relook, at the budgeting. Uh, I would look to things like perhaps the Met Council or other groups that are perhaps a bit high on the bureaucratic and overreaching end that have dollars that perhaps could be reallocated elsewhere. Uh, they would be a good source for looking at that. But uh, my understanding from the numbers from the Minnesota Budget Office as well as from the House of Representatives, we're looking at about $34 billion, which is actually going to be an increase in our revenue. Thank you. Uh, Connie, same question to you. With a projected deficit of over $1 billion in future state budget cycles, how will you specifically propose to fix Minnesota's ongoing budgetary problems? Well, we can't, one of the things we can't do is keep kicking the can down the road. We've been, uh, the state legislature has been using borrowing from our students at over $2 billion to balance the budget. I don't call that a balanced budget. It's worse than one point. One, I mean, excuse me, one billion dollars. We need to be making our um, economy strong, creating jobs, investing in the middle class, in our workers, and being able to compete globally so that we can um, get our economy moving fast. And then the other thing is we need to be investing in our schools so that we have a well-educated um, workforce so that we can strengthen our economy. And the borrowing from tobacco funds or ruining our AAA rating that happened to the legislature, those are not the ways to be balancing our budget. We need to be investing in Minnesota and making Minnesota strong. Right. Opportunity for rebuttal time, Dale? Sure. Uh, I agree that the K-12 through budget cycle is, uh, uh, by doing school shifts is terrible. I'm not for that at all. Um, but I would also, again, uh, remind you that it's been used in the past before and needs to be removed as a tactic period. Uh, I agree about investing. Investing. I also agree about working with small business to create jobs. Thank you. And I guess my time is up. It is. <laughs> uh, Connie, you have an opportunity now if you'd like. No, thank you, guys. All right. Well, those are all the questions that we have time for me to propose to you. At this point, you have a chance to propose one question to your opponent. Uh, Connie, you have the first opportunity to ask a question of Dale. The question that I would ask of Dale is um, he's endorsed by the um, Liberty Caucus and they have a, a Liberty Pledge. And I guess I'd like you to um, share with that what that means and how, um, how you will have your voices be heard when you're um, involved with that type of more of what's considered more of an extreme group at the Capitol. Wow. Well, what Kai is referring to is the Republican Liberty Caucus. And the Republican Liberty Caucus is a, a portion of the Republican Party uh, which does talk about free trade and markets and uh, they are big on making sure that um, we are protecting the voice of the citizen. Um, I'm interested that you find that to be liberal, especially considering the special interest groups that you have on your endorsement list, quite to the left. Um, but the Republican Liberty Caucus, what they want to see is one, that we're controlling the size of government, two, that we're being responsible in our spending, for me, that means operating within the revenue that we have. Uh, and that we just don't hit the easy button of taxation each and every time. Every time you run for office, it's always been about more dollars, more taxes. That is your mantra. That's a bad mantra, and we need to get away from that. At least have another tool in the toolbox. All right. Opportunity for rebuttal time now if you'd like to use it. We have well, 15 seconds. Well, I'll, I'll just... You know, the tone that's, that's set and um, saying always and those sorts of things, that's not what people want at the Capitol. Pe that's what causes gridlock. People want an opportunity to work together, people to get along and, and, to, um, and to work together. I believe that's what people want at the Capitol. 
Thank you. Uh, Dale, now you have your opportunity to ask a question of Connie. Connie, my question uh, surrounds your leaving office in 2006. Um, on your website, you talk about how you re retired and served your full term, and you did so to be a mom and raise your children. The problem with that is that's not the truth. You resigned in 2006, and you resigned to become a full-time lobbyist with Education Minnesota. And the issue that I have with that is that if I go to your website, I will read that very story that you retired, served your full term, and then you left so that you could take care of your children, and that was your whole reason. Whereas if I go to the public Can you record, please go to your question that you have for Connie? My question is, how can our voters trust to know that if they elect you again, that you are not going to leave them for personal interest or gain as you did in 2006? And how are they going to expect you to tell the truth when clearly this is a spin from your website to what the public record has to say? Connie, you now have an opportunity to answer that question. Thank you, Ben. I'm so glad actually he brought that up because I think the, um, the tone and the attacks and the half-truths, those are sort of things that people really don't like hearing from, whether it's candidates or, or politicians. And so I am very glad that he asked that question, actually. People come and go from the legislature for many different, we're a citizen legislature, and people come and go for different jobs. And I'm very proud I came in supporting education, and I was uh, fortunate to be able to get a job that supported um, working parents and worked for Education Minnesota. And I had the opportunity to work with teachers across the state and building partnerships with communities to help make communities stronger. And it was a great opportunity. And as I would love to report, our daughters are, I was able to help them with their college searches and do their activities. And they are now in college now and uh, doing quite well. So um, I'm very glad he asked that question. Thank you. 15 seconds. Well, my rebuttal is simply this. I would have asked this question no matter who the person was because it's an integrity issue. Resigning and retirement are not the same term, plain and simple. And when you say you left to be a full-time mom and you left to be a lobbyist, that is deceptive to the voter. And that hasn't to do about being attacking. It has to do about talking truth. And your truth. time is up. Thank you. We're going to move on now to closing statements. You each have one minute for your closing statements. Connie, you are first with your closing statement. Well, thank you for uh, this opportunity to be able to uh, talk with voters. I um, am, like I said at the beginning, I have a deep love for our community. Growing up in our community, I am very proud to have graduated from Spring Lake Park High School, um, to have lived in Fridley, and um, now to be have the opportunity to represent New Brighton. I work for Ramsey County, and um, New Brighton is a wonderful community with uh, great people, and going door to door and meeting and visiting with people, they're tired of this uh, partisan and they're tired of this tone set at the legislature and frankly that's what leads to gridlock and I, I w want to focus on the values that I care about education, um, our seniors and um, making sure that Minnesota is strong and that we're protecting our environment. So those are the kind of things and the positive things that I'll work on in bringing people together and creating partnerships and helping Minnesota become a strong state and make it great opportunity and hope for Minnesotans. Thank you and I ask for your vote. Thank you. Dale, your closing statement. Well, first off, to address the tone issue, I simply want to say I wanted the voters to leave tonight knowing uh, what the truth was. I would like to say thank you voters for once again allowing me into your homes. I'm a retired military veteran, 21 years of service, retired captain field artillery. I've lived in the district for over 18 years. I'm a family man with two small children, both in public school. Education is very important to me. This is my community. This is my home. I'm running for the right reasons. The issue of truth and trust is critical in a public servant. That's why I brought it up. I would like to end with one final point that separates our campaigns. I do not accept special interest money at all. Connie Bernardi is maxed out on it. And if she's elected in November, she will be going to the Capitol along with her special interests and her obligations to them. If I'm elected in November, the only one who will be going to the Capitol with me is you. I want to say thank you for your support. I want you to know I will work hard for you, very diligently, 
and it would be my honor to serve as your state representative. Thank you, and I'm asking for your vote this November. Thank you. Thank you both for coming in tonight. Thank you for taking time out of your schedules to come in and answer the questions and to have a, uh, the dialogue back and forth. Thank you for that. Thanks, Matt. I want to thank all of you for watching this debate here on North Metro TV. Remember, you can always head to NorthMetroTV.com for any other Local Decision 2012 information that you need to find. If you missed a portion of this debate, you will be able to watch this debate in its entirety right there on NorthMetroTV.com. For the candidates, I've been your moderator, Ben Hale, and thank you. Thank you for watching.